this was done originally for the Hickson meetings with the IEC, but um, it had to be done by Zoom, and I did it on the 24th of July. The presentation's about an hour, um, give or take probably 10 minutes. So um, do forgive me if I bore anybody to death. So right, I'll start. Um, so basically, it's welcome to part two. Um, I had to do it in two parts because my original title covered Staffordshire and, and um, the Black Country as well. Um, so I did those as a part one, but they're freestanding. So if you miss the part one, it doesn't matter. Um, they, they are totally freestanding presentations. So we're looking at the tramways of Birmingham now, and West Brom and Smerwick. And this is uh, a short list of the companies involved in the delivery of public transport services in the Birmingham area. Uh, obviously, it's not definitive list, as I'm sure I've missed some small obscure companies out um, that provided public transport during this time. I can remember as an apprentice going into a shop fitters company in Aston and um, the electrician I was with that happened to be my brother pointing out that at the back of the uh, shop fitters premises with these wooden petitions with these metal frames in them, like baskets, which is what exactly they were. They were the hay baskets for the horses. And it was one of the original uh, tramway um, depots in Birmingham, uh, which had gone into disuse after the horses disappeared. Uh, I should imagine now that it's disappeared years ago with the redevelopment of the, um, of the city. So Birmingham Central Tramways Company began operating horse trams in 1885. A steep grade on Hockley Hill caused the company to convert to Colmore, the Colmore Row line to cable traction. Um, the engineer was Edward Pritchard and, and Joseph Kincaid. Uh, they designed and built the cable tramway. Uh, the Hockley Depot worked two cables, one from Colmer Row and the other to, to and the other to Hansworth. Uh, the Colmer Row cable ran seven miles per hour, and the Hansworth cable ran at nine miles per hour. Uh, the line was not considered a success. In 1896, the City of Birmingham Tramway Company Limited took over the Birmingham Central Tramways. In 1911, Birmingham Corporation took over the Birmingham Tramways Company and converted the cable line and the city's surviving horse, um, steam and battery lines to electric traction. Uh, the cable line last ran in, on the 31st of December 1911. And during my apprenticeship, I was talking about this cable tramway because I worked in Hans was, um, was a company in Hansworth that I worked for. And one of the factories that I worked in up on so so um, off so Road at Rookery Road, um, the foreman remembers these trams. Uh, I mean, he was in his eighties. He he was one of these guys that never retired, um, and he remembered travelling on these trams as a boy, which is quite interesting. The um, there are two engines for driving the uh, for the cable cars was. Uh, Whitmore Street, each 300 horsepower. These engines will, however, work another current cable up Soho Hill to Hansworth, uh, which was expected to be constructed. Large horizontal wheels under the roadway near the brook would lead the cables into the engine house and they will run round the driving pulleys. Uh, the cable will also run around some ingenious divided, devised appliances for maintaining a uniform tension and for preventing a stretch of slack in which, the re which repairing operations may be performed. Uh, the line was laid upon th uh, the three feet six inch gauge rail corresponding with that of the newer tram 
walkways throughout the town. Um, of course, in that period, Birmingham was still a town. And the rails for the car, car wheels were, will be of similar construction with the narrow grooves for the wheel flanges. The middle of the line will be two flat rails placed side by side at such a distance from one, other, from one another as to make narrow slots over the chamber in the roadway through which the cable runs and by means of which the cars may be attached to the cable through the operation of a gripping appliance. And that's this little gap up here. In some existing tramways, the cable chamber was pra um, practically a rectangular iron tube, but it was proposed to use, use instead of this uh, a chamber or gutter of concrete about two foot six inches deep. At every four feet, there will be a chamber, uh, a, stru a structure of wrought T-iron called a yoke, which will serve as a transverse sleeper and support both the outside rails and the rail slots. The latter will be, at be attached by tie bars to the outer rails so that the pressure uh, of the stone sets on the roadway may not tend to push them together and close the slot. Uh, the structure of the yoke is sometimes like a letter V with an O uh, lying in an angle, except that uh, the arms of the V are more widely opened and curved instead of straight. Uh, the cable chamber there will be at, at intervals of 30 feet, cast iron or steel pulley wheels revolving vertically and affording support to the cable. These wheels, which are about 13 inches in diameter, are made somewhat heavy heavy and lie up sorry and lie up in bearings so as to run smoothly without rattle uh, wherever they occur they will be um, constructed by the side of a chamber a small manhole um, through which a workman can reach the pulleys to grease them or to lift one completely out and substitute another in, in case of injury in order not to catch dirt and wet falling through the slot, on the slot, the pulleys and the cable will run not immediately beneath, but a little to one side of the opening. The cable formed a circuit running up the centre of, of one line, round a horizontal or nearly horizontal pulley at the town end and back to Hockley through the chamber of the other line, through the driving machinery and the at the engine house, and then back the first the first line and, and the, in an endless chain. For working traffic the traffic, it was proposed to use two vehicles, one called a dummy, which has the has a gripper to hold onto the cable, and the other a passenger car attached to the former by a coupling. In some tramways, the dummy was used only for the driver or man controlling the gripper, but was more likely to carry outside passengers instead of them being placed on the top of the second car. The working of this mechanism on a straight or nearly straight line looks pretty easy, but when uh, but would have puzzled many people to how a cable is to be worked round sharp corner, sharp corner like that at the top of Snow Hill, and how the cars are to be changed from the up to the down line. The line on this part of the construction are over a subway with an iron girders to support the road, and instead of a vertical pulley 30 feet apart, there was a series of horizontal wheels or sheaves with a flange on the lower side only. These were comparatively close together and would have the effect that as the car ascends Snow Hill and turns the corner, the cable, instead of being nearly beneath the slot, would have been forced running round 
the sheaves rather nearer to the center of the curve and the gripper would pull it sideways from each sleeve sheaves as as it passes and thus avoid striking the horizontal pulleys as by lifting the cable to avoid striking the vertical pulley pulleys in the straight positions Uh, in order for the cars to change from one line to the other, an automatic arrangement was made. Just beyond the points to release the car cable from the gripper, and it was carried a short distance as a lower level in the chamber, it passed round a large terminal pulley revolving in a pit, and then into the chamber of, of the return line, gradually rising until it reached the level of which it could slip into the gripper of the car, which from the point on which it previously lost the cable would, would run by gravitation, but controlled by a break over the points of on the departure line. The object of the subway was so that sheaves on the curves and the terminal pulleys may be constantly examined and the tension given. This is a gripper arrangement. The gripper may perhaps best be explained by, su by supposing that it, that the left hand were put down this put down the slot and the fingers underneath the cable and lifting it up somewhat from the pulley on which it runs and the thumb pressing upon the, the top. By holding it loosely, the cable would run through the hand, but by pressing down the thumb, it would be held fast and carrying the hand along with it. Not only this, but where necessary, the arrangement could be made whereby the cable could be lifted sideways entirely out of the grasp. The gripper is an iron arrangement, which is very much on this principle. The, that which answers the, to the fingers is a, a piece of iron having two little wheels and a lesser to lessen friction, while that which answers the thumb is, is another piece of iron, which by the action of the lever pressed down tightly on the cable as to hold it fast. So you've got this um, arrangement here, which is the what they say is the bottom of, the, of your hand. And then as you close your fingers and bring your thumb down, this would be your thumb and would grab the cable. Um, it, it's quite an interesting thought of um, how the driver operated these um, particular devices. And it must have um, needed a, a lot of att pay attention all the time to what they were doing. Um, the Screw type grip, um, still seen on this car, is employed um, two hand wheels and the, the, on the hollow screw fixed on the car floor. Um, by turning the upper wheel, the gripper could open the jaws and grab the cable, while the lower wheel uh, lowered the grip under the slot and, the, and in the street where it could. Uh, could contact with the cable. This is from the um, San Francisco Museum. Uh, and quite surprisingly, cable cars were um, very widely used during this period all over the world, in, and also in London, which I, I didn't realise until I did this research, and Australia and New Zealand. So it's not just San Francisco that had cable cars. Um, the cable tri tram line was opened in Birmingham between Colmaro and the town and Hockley on 24th of March um, 1888. The former horse trams, tram route from Colmaro to Hockley Brook, um, which was rebuilt to three foot six inches gauge, was converted to cable traction by the Payton Tramway Company on the 20th, 20th of April 1889. The line was extended to Hansworth, that's the new inns at Hansworth, 
it's presented a few technical problems, but the termini were on the rising gradient, so journeys began under gravity. Um, two cables were used, one for Colmoreau to Hockley Station, another for the rest of the line. Thus, the drivers only had one cable brake to jump. When not under cable traction, the cars were shunted on and off the system by a steam tram locomotive, one of which was retained for this purpose until the cable car ceased on the 30th of June 1911. This card was produced at the date of the withdrawal of the cable trams published by the economic printing company. The image of the tram has been greatly modified with the addition of the title Hansworth and an advertisement for their own printing. And the card carries a poem by G.H. Poor old cable card, thy work is done. You were a good servant when you could run. Still, in our memory, you'll ever be dear. We wish you long rest. Electricity is here. Apparently, the demise of the cable car tr tram um, came partly due to poor maintenance, which led to the bearings, etc., wearing, and the noise created by great distress to the created great distress to the residents along the route. Um, one of the things I tried to work out was um, by my reading, which is not included in this, it proved to be far, far more economical than steam trams or horse-drawn trams. Of course, even today, owning horses is, ex is extremely expensive. And um, I was trying to work this out in my own mind from my, my experience of working in the jewellery quarter where I used to go into these factories and all you had was the pulleys and belts all over your heads being driven by a slip ring motor. And um, I remember my boss telling me about how much energy was lost in all these pulleys and bearings. And my mind was working on this factor of how did this run so economically compared with everything else when you've got all these pulleys? And... Um, of course, I hadn't thought of that the cable car going down the gradient was assisting the engines by pulling the other cable car up. So you've got a certain amount of kinetic energy in the system, which must have helped um, the, the steam engines. So therefore, they didn't burn so much fuel. So it was quite an economical um, system. Just, just a quick historical overview of the trams. A City of Birmingham Tramways Company Limited was a result of a number of changes in the ownership of the tramway franchises within the city since its creation in 1872. Um, Birmingham and District Tramways Company operated trams in Birmingham from 1872. Birmingham and District Tramway Company Limited acquired the Birmingham Tramway and Omnibus Company in, in 1876. Birmingham District Tramways Company Limited was in turn taken over by Birmingham Central Tramway Company in 1886. In 1896, the assets of Birmingham Central Tramway Company Limited were acquired by City of Birmingham Tramways Company and the City of Birmingham Tramways Company operated trams from 1896 to 1911. The last route to Birmingham closed in, on the 31st of December 1911. Uh, most of the services were taken over by Birmingham Corporation Tramways. This seemed to, this, what I found was very complicated was all the different operators that there were. Um, the history of services in Birmingham to Dudley by the way of Smerich and Albury began when Birmingham Midland and Tramway Company was formed in November 1885. This was to take over the lines to be constructed by the Birmingham and Western District Tramway Company outside the Birmingham boundary and on Dudley Road. And these lines leased from Birmingham Corporation 
within the town's boundary, with the exception of the proposed Heath Street route, which although laid was never operated by in steam in steam days. The lease on the lines within the boundary was held until 1906. On the 6th of July 1885, the Birmingham Midland Tramways Company operated its first steam tram line from Lionel Street along Dudley Road to the town boundary as Grove Lane. On the 30th of August 1885, the line had been extended to Smerwick and Albury with an hourly tram ser steam tram service to Dudley Station. Although not directly involved with the later operation of Birmingham Corporation, there were two other branch lines. These were both from West Bromwich, one going to Spon Lane and the other via Bromford Lane to Albury. Such was the poor level of traffic generated on both these strict steam tram operated services. By the 20th of May 1893, arrangements had been made for Mr. B. Crowther of West Bromwich to operate horse tram service on both routes. August 1899, the Bristol British Electric Traction obtained control of the Birmingham and Midland Tramways Company with the intention of electrifying the line. In February 1902, an arrangement was reached with the Birmingham City Council that enabled the company to convert and operate the line with electric traction between Summer Row and the boundary until the lease ran out in June 1906. The eight mile line to Dudley opened for electric trams on the 21st of November 1904. A newly constructed branch from Cape Hill to Bearwood, uh, the Soho branch along Heath Street was opened on 31st of September 1904 and was extended over the company's own tracks to Soho Station on the 24th of May 1905. On 30th of June 1906, the lease on the section within the city ran out on the following day, Corporation tram cars began joint service on the Bearwood and Soho routes. Sorry, press the wrong button. Uh, the West Bromwich and Wensbury and Dudley route ran from Woodman Pub, which was demolished um, in, two, nine, in 2004, which was the only stretch of quadruple track on the Birmingham system laid this way so that on match days trams could be parked on the by the curbside inbound and on and outbound tracks thus enabling service trams to proceed normally beyond the hawthorns was a long straight stretch of track across open country to the residential end of west bromwich high street it was there that hockley that the hockley bogey cars with their 63 and 70 horsepower motors could achieve 40 miles an hour. Once into West Bromwich High Street from about Trinity Road, the main shopping centre began. The so-called golden mile of shops included the important junction of Dartmouth Square. It was here that the Birmingham and Midland single deck tram cars ran the Spon Lane shuttle to Smerrick. Um, Spon Lane was the terminus for the number 77 service. After continuing past Bromford Lane, along ran um, the other Birmingham and Midland single track trams. These trams reached Carter's Green at the Ferry Clock, clock uh, nearly opposite the Deco Style Town Cinema, and the tram service number 73 terminated. The 75 service fought right into Old Meeting Square and climbed through Black Back Lane before reaching the crest of a steady climb to Hilltop. After passing the early Victorian houses, the tram began a steep descent to Holloway Bank and into the Tame Valley. Wensbury, uh, one of the heavy industrial centres of the Black Country, was reached at the bottom of the lower high street at White Horse Public House until September 1930. It was possible to see the company tram cars on the Darleston service of the Warsaw Corporation tram cars on their service to their hometown. The 74 route at Carter's Green ran 
industrialised land, sorry, ran by the industrialised landscape of Swan Village to Great Bridge. The district clustered around the marketplace and marked the last short working from Birmingham, which was numbered 76. The trams took the left fork through Horsey Heath to Dudley Port, where the Ryan Aqueduct and the LNWR main line to Wolverhampton crossed the route. The company days, in the company days, the former could only be negotiated by open top. The overhead was skewed to one side, but even so, none of the older, oldest four wheel trams would pass under the bridge. The route then continued to climb gently to Burn Tree, but had to, to negotiate the humpback bridge over Birmingham Canal near Sedgley. At Burn Tree, the 74 joined the Birmingham and Midland routes from Smerrick and Albury, running over the tracks to the terminus of both routes at bridge, uh, at the, on the bridge above Dudley Station at the bottom of Castle Hill. Um, about nine miles from Snow Hill. The problem that they had uh, with bridges, which was not just Dudley Port, um, but was also in um, Sally Oak, was the bridges were too low. So the cable um, would virtually hit the roof of the, um, the tram car as it went underneath because there just wasn't enough space. So they had to um, run the cable um, a, a, the overhead cable so the, to the side so that um, as the tram went through it, its arm had to go virtually flat on the top of the tram to the side so it could still pick up the cable. Um, this was uh, quite a, one of the, the major problems that they did have. Uh, in 1872 Birmingham and District Tramways Company Limited opened a mainly single track horseway, horse tramway under the authority of Birmingham and Staffordshire tramways. Constructed to a gauge of four foot eight and a half inches. It, rep rep sorry, it ran between the Birmingham boundary at Hockley Brook to West Bromwich via Handsworth. At Carter's Green to the north of West Brom, the tramway branched with one line serving Hilltop near Wensbury while the other branch forked west to Dudley Port via Great Bridge. The tramway was further served by a number of feeder horse buses. The initial fleet consisted of 12 open top double deck tram, a double deck cars by Metropolitan in crimson and cream livery, housed in the depot at Carter's Green. Brown and Marshall and Company became the Metropolitan Amalgamated Railways Company and Wagon Company in 1902. Falcon, uh, uh, Falcon and Br Brush are of Loughborough. George Starbuck and Company Limited um, in, in 1871-72. Starbuck Car and Wagon Company Limited, 1872-1886. Uh, to 18, George F. Mills and Company. And then 1886-1905, it became the United Electric Car Company. Um, Mills uh, Limited, Mills, Voss and Co. Formed in December 1882, the Birmingham Suburban Tramway, the first route to be opened was the horse tram route from the Old Square to Neutrals Park Road and, and via Great Lister Street, which commenced operations in 11th of November 1884, by which time the company had been reformed as Birmingham Central Tramway Company Limited. It was authorised by Birmingham Suburban Tramway Order of 1882. Uh, the line was constructed to narrow gauge, three foot six inches, and the early livery is reported to be sage and dark green.